Welcome to Conversation with H, and we have a superb, incredible guest, you know. Incredible guest. Former teaching assistant, the pastor and the visionary for Art 2.0 in London. Make sure, hold on, you need to go, go there, you know. Go <laughs> check on. it out. 200, close to 200, 200 members? Right? 200, 200 members. 200 plus, we ain't even just say 200, we say 200 plus. We're growing. The oldest of five siblings. Is that correct? Six now. Oldest of six siblings. Six siblings. So you got you got the advanced research, I do the research. <laughs> the theology, the psychology is in his back. He's the husband to Ron Attacky. He's the star from birth, now he's star upon the pulpit. I introduce you, formerly known as Arms, you know, Om, you know, underscore AOS. On the IG, what is your name, Omar Attacky? How are you doing today, sir? I'm well, thank you. It's a beautiful day. It's a great day. It is. For those who don't know who you are, who's Omar Taki? Uh, as you said, bro, um, um, well, I was born to Ghanaian parents, mm. Ghanaian Lebanese. Um, I am the oldest of six, as you've said, yeah. husband of one wife. Uh, <laughs> one day I will be a father in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, I am the lead pastor of ARC 2.0, um, a growing ministry. We are heading towards our one year anniversary. Student of psychology, theology, mm -hmm. um, more so theology at this present moment in time. And yeah, I'm looking to do so much more. But I think if I'm going to boil it all down to one thing, I'm just a lover of Jesus, bro. Mm. What was your family life like? I was the first child that was born amongst a whole group of young adults. Mm. So when there was always parties and I was the one that was there. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, they put me to bed, but I'd always be up. Yeah. And then I had more siblings. And I guess life as a child was great. Mm. up until you know things started to get a bit messy between mum and dad and I started to see things that I shouldn't have seen yeah, yeah, yeah. but childhood was great I can't say that I wanted for anything like we had things like pinball tables in my house oh wow yeah bro like oh, yeah. We, we had a slide in my house so <laughs> I'm telling you so living. listen so we had everything that we wanted but on the flip side we saw a lot of things we shouldn't have seen okay you know what I mean so we're talking things like domestic violence um alcohol police turning up to the house so although you have everything that you want in material mm. you didn't necessarily get the great security and grounding yeah, yeah, that yeah, you yeah. needed as a child um that's not to say that my parents done anything wrong but it was the norm growing up yeah and then i, I became a child model as well okay yeah so the argos magazines and all the rest of it they yeah. used to fly me out to different countries but with that so i guess with that bringing it into being a pastor mm. it's a bit interesting then you, then i also done stage school as a child as well so they put me through acting like drama singing and whatnot this is all before secondary school Sweet. yeah so i guess i was confident from a young age um i didn't know anything about girls yeah. in primary school yeah, yeah, yeah. um so everything about me was dragon ball z pokemon <laughs> you know what I mean? like, that was just me through and through so i was a very innocent child yeah yeah, yeah. and then Got to secondary school, mum and dad split up mm. um, and I didn't have a father figure at this point. So mm. the older guys in the area started to, you know, become that figure to me. Mm. And I realised, because I used to like B2K as well, imagine that. Oh, like Omar and Yeah, bro, because my name is yeah. Omar, innit? Oh, so, yeah. <laughs> I, I used to like B2K, bro. I used to proper wear the, the jerseys, the headband with the, with the do-rag and the, and the headband you had around the whole it. Thing. Yeah, bro, the, the sweatbands here. <laughs> Bro, it was sad, bro, with the Timberland boots, the, the bootleg <laughs> jeans, bro, it was bad. Like, and I used to go around saying my name's Mario. I'm telling you. So, bro, imagine I've come to secondary school now, and that's my swag. And obviously, these lot, it's all channel you, grand, yeah, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, Here's yeah. this guy dressing up like an American, bro. I got bullied, fam. I wouldn't even say bullied. I got buoyed off my first week of secondary school. I said, never again. I dropped everything, bro. I remember, I think... I had these blue, red, white, yeah, blue, red, um, blue and red Jordans. Yeah. And I was wearing them, but I remember I was wearing something black, like the swag was off. I had like a black tracksuit on with yellow right in here and blue and yeah. red Jordans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I got grilled. I said from that day on, do rag gone, these garms gone. I'm not wearing nothing flashy. It was just dark clothes from that moment onwards, bro. After just, seven days? Bro, I was, yeah, finished. Bro, I used to wear magnetic earrings. Do you remember the magnetic earrings? <laughs> I used to wear magnetic earrings, bro. Get me? <laughs> Telling you, bro. And then the girls would be like, oh, sweet boy, sweet boy. 
You get me? So year seven, year seven was a revelation for me. <laughs> and then I think when I switched to this channel you kind of vibe, which was very quick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the year eleven started giving me like the knives to yeah, hold yeah. on to in oh, year seven. Wow. And so because I was easily influenced, I'd keep their knives inside my bag. Mm. Um, things like being in the canteen with them. So in year seven, I wasn't with my age mates. I was with the year 11s. Okay. So I'd see the way they were interacting with girls, how they were cussing each other, throwing food at each other. And I was just picking up these bad habits. And so who, the Oma from year six to year seven, completely two different people. I changed very quickly. It's like the slits in the eyebrow and yeah, just yeah, the yeah, girls. Yeah. And unfortunately, I say unfortunately, I lost my virginity at that age, year mm. seven, right? So that's a child that you're looking at in year six, going over to leaving school by himself, mm. as young as those kids that you see today, mm -hmm. losing his virginity very quickly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then just the perversion of the older girls in the school as well, kind of like touching me mm. and all the rest of it. And I thought I liked it mm. and I did like it, mm. but I never really saw it as they were doing something to me. Yeah, do you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, it was mean? just a norm at that particular yeah, time. Yeah, it was normal. Yeah, 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 do you yeah, know yeah. what I'm saying? So it made me very perverted at a young age. Yeah. Um, and so the kid that my mum saw at home, who she knew to be innocent, mm. when he left the house, he was a completely different person. Wow. So mum thinks I'm this way, mm. but at school I'm a different way. And now it's, I'm getting into fights. So the year 11s are telling me, punch this year 10 in the face. Punch this year 9 in the face. And I'm doing it. Then the year 11s leave and I'm left to... You're on your ones. <laughs> you having to fight me. <laughs> I'm left so. to deal with everything, you yeah, know what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it was, it was hard because I had a lot of enemies in my secondary school. Mm. You know what I mean? I used to think that I had friends, yeah. but when I look back in retrospect, I bullied a lot of them. So, for me, growing up, life wasn't... The innocent child became someone completely different. Mm. And I lost myself very quickly um, to the point where I was just a rude kid and my name was spread around the area. Our boys are hearing about me. They're coming outside the school for me. I didn't even realise I had so much beef. Why? So, yeah, man. I think I can even take it one step further. Mm. Um, I lived in West London. Yeah. So I'm originally from Labrick Grove um, and I moved to Shepherd's Bush. And in Shepherd's Bush, I lived on one of the main roads where all the boys from Shepherd's Bush lived. Mm. Conningham Road, yeah? And my next door neighbor was the same age as me. And he went to a secondary school, right? Where all the boys from Shepherd's Bush were from. Same age as me. Mm. But I'm a Labrick Grove boy. Mm. So I come to Shepherd's Bush. I'm there. Eventually, let's say, for example, because my mum's a single mum now. Mm -hmm. Let's say my mum, uh, November, the electricity has gone off in the house. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to sit outside 4 p.m. in the dark on my, on my doorstep. So no. I'd knock at my next door neighbor's house, go inside there. He'd be inside there with all his school friends. Uh, but I'm a Labrick Grove boy. They're all Shepherd's Bush boys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And because I was sitting around the oldest, the year 11s, I knew how to hold my own. Yeah, yeah, so when yeah. the year 7s, when, when, when these boys are trying to get onto me, I'm throwing it right back at them. So yeah. they're like, hey, don't have it, don't have it. Da -da -da -da. Yeah, 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 so I'm starting yeah. to fight his brethren. Now, in his yard, in his crib. And then his mum's like, get out of my house. Da -da -da. So I'm, I'm, <sighs> there's tension now between me and my next door neighbour. Yeah, but yeah. what that's doing is now it's the person I've got into a fight with wants to scrap me. Right? So I've got into a fight with him. Fight went the way the fight went. Mm -hmm. He started saying how, yeah, Omar said this about you to people in the area. Omar said that about you. Next thing you know, all these boys from these schools are coming to me saying, what are you, Omar Taki? What's this I'm hearing you said about me? Now, pride. I'm like, bro, I didn't say anything about you. They're like, no, you did. Are you dumb? And then boom, that's yeah, yeah. it. Yeah, as soon as you hear that, it's yes, finished. it's off. Yeah, it's yeah, finished. Yeah. So now I'm beefing this one, I'm beefing that one, beefing this one, beefing that one. So 14 years old, this is my life. Every time I'm coming home, my next door neighbor, all the boys are outside his house. They say about 15 of them, my house is upstairs, his is downstairs. So I have to beef to get into my crib. Or I'll just go to my boy's yard and then have to come to my house later when they're all gone. So that was my life, consistently, consistently. Then they start coming to, coming to my school for me. So my house at home isn't safe. Mm. You know what I mean? So that was my continuous journey from secondary school. And then one situation happened in secondary school where they came to the school and I told all the boys in my, in my school to come outside and fight. Mm. No, I went to secondary school in South London. Mm -hmm. We've all gone outside to fight. All the boys from my school, there's about 30 of them outside waiting for me and my boy. Come outside. All the boys in the school step back, watch me get rushed. So imagine journeying home wow. and having to always navigate your way into the house. Mm. And then imagine them coming to your school and your very friends 
don't step into your beef with you. Mm. Now, my issue was I got involved in everyone's drama. So I had an expectation for them to get involved in mine. You thought it was going to back you up. And that was my whole thing um, around that period. Yeah, man. How did, how did all of those things affect you now? How do they affect you now? I am... Um, all right, so I'll say that to this day, I think because I've been through things, so I've been stabbed, mm -hmm. um, I've been rushed more times than I can count, um, and I've always kind of been a lone wolf because mm -hmm. of that, that, that scenario. So I feel like I've seen death in the face. Mm -hmm. Because of that, I'm not afraid of anything. Mm -hmm. Or um, I'd also say that it's made me hyper-vigilant mm -hmm. in that, how do I put this into words? Um, I notice things. Mm -hmm. I pick things up very quickly. Mm. You know what I mean? And energy speaks to me. I'd say one of the ways that it affected me, actually, this is for church. Because I came from that life and I didn't grow up in church, mm -hmm. right? When I came into church, I saw people that were different to the type of men that I'd been around my whole life. Yeah, 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 yeah. So obviously we say church boys, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've come from one environment into that environment and I'm speaking with people, but they're not speaking my language. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm with you. So I didn't really know how to adapt and, and befriend people in church mm. because of my Experience. experiences. It's only, I'd say, in the past two years where I've really been able to come out of that. Mm. But when I first became a believer, bro, I was screw facing. I'm like, bro, what are you looking at? You know? <laughs> what are you saying? You know what I'm they're saying? trying to pray for you. <laughs> Bro, came inside there, no one's laying hands on me, I'm not falling to the floor, you're not, all that stuff, remove it from me, I'm not having it, you know what I mean? Um, but I'd say that, yeah, that's, it's come out in the way that I preach, yeah. if you notice in the way that I preach, I'm mm. very direct, yeah, yeah, it's yeah, because yeah. I've had to be direct my whole life. Mm. So some people would colour it as one thing, when I'd colour it as something completely different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? How do you view yourself as a younger, youngster, when 11 years old, you kind of then have to become the man of the house? So we're going back a little bit, but obviously it kind of, it will speak to... I, I think I assumed the responsibility too quickly. Mm. Uh, I don't think I should have ever really become the man of the house. It didn't allow me to be a child. Mm. Um, so I did have a great childhood up until year six, but that man of the house business, that protective side of me, has, it has affected me to this day, you know, actually, mm. funny enough. So my brothers and sisters, I take, I, I felt, let me say, mm. like I was responsible for their lives. Mm. That man of the house business. So when I saw my siblings get into certain things, it's me that's there. So I had to go to the parents' evenings. Wow. You know what I mean? I had to be the one to pick them up from certain things. And mm. that kind, that level of responsibility at that age, though it seems like it's great, mm. it robbed me of another side of me developing into a particular person. I just became, bro, I had to mature quickly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, it, it just, it completely took me away from just life in the present. Mm. I had to just become someone that I wasn't. So yeah, yeah, imagine yeah. that, imagine having to become, like you've got your next door neighbors and you're beefing them. So you have to adapt and become someone tough. Then you've got the man of the house situation. So you have to, you have to adapt and become someone mature. Mm. And all of these adaptations throughout my life caused me to not even know who I was. You know what I mean? Mm. So I, I won't even tell you what my nickname was, but my nickname was very fitting oh. of who, who I became. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. just wasn't, I wasn't me. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, so I lost myself 100%. Um, that man of the house business, I mean, it's difficult because you assume a responsibility, but then there's mixed messages. So it's, yeah, you're the discipline, you're the, you're the one who enforces discipline in the mm. house. So I used to discipline my, my, my siblings because th that's what I saw. Yeah. So the smacks, me, you know what I mean? To the point mm. where that kind of fractured my relationship with my siblings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and who, who should be doing that? Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? So it's interesting because all those things have made me who I am today. I've mm. made mistakes and I've had to learn from all of them. So I yeah. can't tell you that I've ever been guided. I don't think I've ever been guided. Really? Yeah. Even, even like moving towards getting into church and those kind of things. Yeah. yeah. So how do you deal with that? That's a heavy weight. It is a heavy weight. <laughs> How, so how do you deal with that? Or do you not deal with that and you're just trying to learn how to cope with no, that? I'll, I'll, I'll give you the God's honest answer that a yeah. lot of people don't like to hear. Mm. I haven't done anything since I gave my life to Christ. I know. <laughs> I know. Re reload that one. All right. So 
I got saved, I don't think I, I saved myself. Yeah, 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 I'm with you. Okay, I'm, yeah? with you. I'm with you. So I don't remember saying in my head, yeah, today I'm going to go give my life to Jesus. I just went to go see what a church was about and yeah, yeah, yeah. I got saved, right? From that moment, two days later, I get a dream. The dream tells me, like, the devil meets me in my sleep. Mm. In that dream, I realize what the dream's about. I break up with my girlfriend of two years. I yeah. just have a conviction to do it. Mm. Calm, did it. After that, testimony, 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 just everything falling into place. I'm falling in love with the word of God. I'm mm. reading it. All of a sudden, my memory's coming back. I'm remembering mm. childhood situations. Mm. I'm dealing with them by myself. I'm reading the scriptures. I'm finding out that this same Omar that didn't think he was articulate can mm. actually pray. Mm. This same Omar can actually preach. Yeah. Then I'm sharing my testimony in places. And this same Omar is now having unforgiveness fall off him by sharing his story. Yeah, 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 so yeah. I'm just doing these things, not knowing what I'm doing. I'm not doing it in my own strength. I'm just yeah. doing what I think is, I'm being. And I'm with, you. with everything, it's not God saying, go and do this now, go and do that now. It's just simple moving by faith. Mm. And by him doing that, things just kept falling into place. It was, and it's like, I look at my life and all I can say about it is I've done nothing. Mm. I've simply just moved. I, yeah, had, yeah. I haven't had to overthink anything or be anxious about anything. Mm. It all just slots into place. Let's go back a little bit. You get kicked out of college after two months. <laughs> yeah. So the first thing I want to kind of like say that I noticed is that you talk about, you know, you did the Argos catalogs and you were, you were going to, to, to school to kind of, you know, to act and to, to sing. But then you, say, you, you said just then is that this Omar that you didn't realise could be so articulate, could preach. Mm. There's preparation in all of that. Mm -hmm. Granted, mm -hmm. you couldn't see the vision because mm -hmm. you were so young, mm -hmm. but there's preparation in all that. Mm -hmm. So where you're saying you couldn't mm -hmm. see that, mm -hmm. you were prepared to do something like that mm. at a young age. Mm. I, I, yeah. But I want to go back to the college because how 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 do you get kicked out of college after two months? I, I understand it can happen. <laughs> I'm <getting> twisted. <laughs> I get it can happen. All right, I went to college in Labrick Grove, which is the area I grew yeah, up yeah, in, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, St. Charles. So after college, all my boys will be outside the college. So imagine you've got people from South London coming there, North London, and yeah, obviously yeah, yeah. here's Omar. This college is in his ends. Yeah everyone after college is coming outside to see Omar. Yeah, so it's yeah. like, this is my college. Yeah, like, yeah, 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 yeah. You want to chuck, you know that this is my ends. I might as well call it OT college. It's yeah, my yeah, college, yeah, yeah. you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so that, that's what it was when I came, but I was still antisocial. So okay. I, was, I was anti. Me, I couldn't make no friends. Straight screw face. You might even be thinking that I've got a screw face right now. I won't even know. My face was just screw face. Because, bro, walking down the street, I didn't know who I was beefing. Yeah, but you say that, though. Hold on, before you carry Go on, go on. You say that, though. But you just told me it was Omar's college. Yeah. So people are coming to see you, but you, you, you're, you're antisocial at the same time. Yeah. But yet you've got a social presence about you. Yeah. It's weird, isn't it? It's weird. Bro, I, I can't explain to you the amount of... I, I had a warped mind, mm. yeah? So obviously, we're going to talk about reputation as a young person, you're on the road. Yeah, yeah, Money, yeah. Money, power respect mm -hmm. yeah sex all that kind of stuff right mm -hmm. so my my the way that i earned respect was by banging someone in the face mm -hmm. robbing someone yep, yep, yep. that's bringing the status to my name but on the flip side of it it makes you paranoid yeah, can yeah, i go yeah. to this area now yep so although there's i'm social i still don't know who to trust mm -hmm. Because the same person I banged in the face, I don't remember his face, but he yeah, remembers yeah. me. There's levels. There's levels so to this. There's levels to this. So even though you're social, there's, there's a line. Come on. There's levels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's you. consequences to everything that you do, in mm -hmm. it. So you're always living life on the edge, bro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, yeah, it's, it's unfortunate. So <laughs> it, it, was, it was so unfortunate. Um, yeah. I, I, yeah. I don't even know, bro. It's, it, the college situation was, I got stabbed. Mm. Yeah. You know? So I've come away from that secondary school where it was in South London. I'm now in a secondary, um, in a college that's in my area, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So I'm walking down the street one day. I remember um, this is the whole red bandana, blue bandana yeah, situation. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I was at my friend's house in East Acton the night before. So I was smoking heavily during this time. So I've mm -hmm. just been stabbed. Mm -hmm. um, no, let me backtrack. Let me backtrack. So... I'm at my friend's house, we're smoking, mm -hmm. and then my friend lives in West Kent, so I gave him my, my pedal back to get home, and mm -hmm. I walked home. Mm -hmm. Now, I couldn't walk home in my area. Mm. Like, bro, just, it weren't running. Mm -hmm. I live in this area, and I can't even be seen on my own two feet. 
because I was always on a pedal bike. Mm -hmm. I gave my friend my pedal bike to get home. So now it's a risk. So I walked home, East Acton to Shepherd's Bush is about 20 minutes, walked home at about three in the morning, mm -hmm. got in. 5 p.m. comes the next day. Mum's like, oh, but you always have to go out. And I, I hated the house. Mm. Oh, but bearing in mind, these, kid, these guys have kicked off my door, run up into my house, all of that. You know what I mean? And so I'm living in stress. Mm. Like, so I've left the house anyway, but I'm leaving on foot. Mm. Me like a donor. The, this, my area that I live in is blue bandanas, mm -hmm. Labrick Groves, red bandanas. Right? So I've got the red bandana tucked in my back pocket, walking through Shepherd's Bush like some donut. I've got a hoodie on. I remember I've got my headset in, I'm walking down the street, get to the top of my road, 12 boys, turn the corner, blue bandanas, barging each other, boom, boom, boom. Obviously they're saying something, and I turn around, I say something back, they come around, one of them puts their arm around my shoulder. So I take his arm off me, boom, it starts getting cracking, we're fighting yeah, in the yeah, street, yeah, yeah, yeah. fighting in the street, we get, to, we get to the bus stop, I'm getting rushed, but I've just got one guy and I'm hitting him. I'm just getting smacked just right <laughs> It's hitting it. Get me now. Back then, because um, of my my bike, the mm. bike chain, the um, disc bit used to cut my jeans. Yeah. So I used to tuck my sock over my jeans. Okay. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. So I'm fighting. All of a sudden, um, they they run away and they're screaming their postcodes. I'm cussing them, but then I feel something heavy at the bottom of my jeans. So I put it out of the socks and blood flows everywhere. Right. So I just been stabbed. I didn't realize that I didn't feel it. Anything yeah, like yeah. that. So I'm sitting down now, some Somalian people run out, they start strapping me up, screaming and all that, and then they call the ambulance, I get in the ambulance, I go. Mm. That's during, I, I got stabbed two days before my birthday, my 17th birthday, so that was November the 28th, 20, don't remember, 2009, I think, something like that. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I've been stabbed, I've gone hospital, I've spent my birthday in the hospital, come out, and I've messaged my tutor and said, listen, I've been stabbed, so I can't come into college. I thought you was lying. I don't know what they were thinking. I said, bro, I sent it to the teachers and stuff, innit? Mm. So I'm stuck at home, I'm smoking, playing PlayStation, not doing much, mm. right? All I'm thinking about is I'm going to get this guy. Mm. Remember, bearing in mind, I still live in the area where these... I got stabbed at the top of my road. I'm living in the house, right, like, five-minute walk from where I got stabbed. Mm. So January comes now where we go back to college. I've walked into college. As soon as I walk into college, the teacher says, get up. Now, I've got anger problems. I had anger problems. Ah, so that's it, you are. That's it, you are. I was gone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I started flipping it. tables. Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> I started moving that, back. Yeah, yeah, that's it, you are. I started, I started flipping tables, bro. Yeah, and then that was it. Kicked out. I remember walking out and just thinking, yeah, that's it then. I weren't going to apply for another college. I didn't care about my, my education. Yeah, I didn't yeah, have yeah. no one to make me. Like, my family, I didn't see marriage. I didn't really see university yeah, yeah. like around me. Yeah, all yeah, I yeah. saw was my boys and all that was was we're on the roads. Mm. So I didn't have prospects of going to university or staying in education. My mum was a single mum. I, I, was, I was moving like a rebellious kid. Mm. My mum couldn't tell me anything. Mm -hmm. So I left college. I'm not applying for a new college. That was it. I started shutting. I, 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 I robbed some guy and then I picked up a, a quarter ounce of weed and then started shutting. Mm. And that was it. Started making money, looking for this kid. And then that was it. One thing turned into another. You know what I mean? How come pastor just seems to just find its way to you? Like beef, fights. I think it was all, this is going to sound very weird, but I think it was all written. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, thousand percent. I agree. Yeah, I think, because it's not fair. Yeah, no, <laughs> not, not at all. <laughs> it's not fair, bruv. Like, the stuff that was happening to me was not fair. Because the amount of times you buy yourself, and there's 12, or there's 10, or there's 8, yeah. or there's 15. Bro, it weren't fair, bro. It weren't fair. And, and people can look at it, and this is something that I think, even if people from my old secondary school hear this, I need to apologise. Listen, I was a mad kid, yeah? <laughs> no, hear me. I was a mad kid. Because I heard that when I got stabbed, people were happy. <laughs> wow. I swear to God. And I was, like, it, I was like, oh my gosh. Like, and you know, bro, I don't, I, I think there was a, a strong self-righteousness in me. I thought I could do no wrong. Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah. anyone who had an issue with me, I'm like, you've got problems. Wow. Bro, I was stubborn, bro. No one could talk to me. No one could talk to me, bro. Like, and it was just malicious for no reason. So it wasn't just boys, it was girls. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was me sleeping with girls, deleting their number, proudly. Wow. Like, so much so that my cousins from South now, they're a bit more traditional, you know, the African parents have really ingrained morals yeah, yeah, in them. Yeah. My cousins will see me doing this stuff and be like, bro, you're a demon and I'll laugh. Like, bro, I swear that I'm yeah, 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 Bro, yeah, yeah, yeah. it was so tapped. But the more that you do that, the more that you have beef with people, 
the more that you're doing this stuff to girls, bro, the less human you start to feel, bro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think as well, with your story that we know so far, we ain't even gotten up to the fact that you was atheist before you become Christian. We're, we're, <laughs> we're surface. Mm. But what you've talked about is you, you said about how you really, it didn't allow you growing up and then becoming a man of the house at such a young age, didn't allow you to kind of truly know who you were. Yeah. So then what happens is you then grow into a, a state of mind where it's like, I'm just doing, I'm just doing these things like regardless, because you don't have an understanding of your true identity, mm. which is as much as it might seem scary to some people who are watching to other people, this is like the norm. This is their life. Yeah. What you lived is similar to what they're either lived or experiencing right now. So does your experiences then lead you to become not believing in a God or is it from somewhere else? It's my experiences. Okay. Definitely. I, I saw way too much for there to be the, the existence of a God to be real. I saw too much bad mm. for me to think that there's actually a God. Like it, it was experiential. Mm -hmm. It wasn't anything else. It was my own theory. It was, it was the confusion as well of a Muslim father and a Christian mum, mm. the contradiction that I saw in their lives. Mm -hmm. um, it was a mixture of so many things. And then even on the roads, um, me and my friends would talk about the devil a lot, mm. which was just a, a whole nother, just, yeah, whatever, man. <laughs> <laughs> we, used to, we used to talk about a lot of, um, a lot of bad, because there was a lot of juju that mm. was going on around us. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we used to talk about that quite a bit as well. And I mm. think just, yeah, the trauma of life and um, my cousin also going through a very, tra well, I call it that, witnessing my cousin lose limbs, mm. Um, but still be alive today by the grace of God, like functioning fantastically, lover. Mm. But to see that, and she was such a great person, just yeah. so helpful, and to be like, that's not fair. Mm -hmm. Like no one, and it was so random how it happened. Like her hands just started to go purple and creep up and then had to chop it off before it could go up. And it was just like, it's not fair for someone like her mm. to experience something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So to know everything that I was going through, the betrayals that I'd experienced as well, mm. And then to see that happen, it was like, for me, you're not real. And so a lot of my atheism came from anger. Mm. It came from anger at life. So how do you then become a Christian? Life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I get life changed. <laughs> life. Life, man. Um, I think with all of that decay. Yeah. So let's just say, for example, you start with disappointment. I've been disappointed in mm -hmm. life that disappointment because I have a high, a high expectation of people and they don't deliver. Mm. I'm disappointed. Mm -hmm. So it makes me miserable. Yeah. I don't know who to trust. Mm -hmm. that, mis that being miserable lent me to being a lonely person because mm. I don't know who to speak to. So yeah, let me just yeah, be yeah, lonely. Yeah. So now it's, oh, Om is always like this. Om is always like that. So I'm completely misunderstood. Mm. That misunderstanding and being lonely leads me to depression. Mm. No one understands me. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And then the more that you stay in depression, because it can go from mild to chronic, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? So I've started with depression around 12 when I was going through the situation with the boys, because mm -hmm. I'm getting black eyes in the crib, mum ain't seeing me with black eyes. So I'm feeling like, no one's asking me, oh my, how are you? Wow. All the rest of it, you know what I mean? So I'm just going through all of this and what happens in this house stays in this house. I don't know how to speak. Men don't cry, all that silliness, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm just inside mm -hmm. and I've got anger problems. You touch me just a little bit, I'm blowing up. Mm. And so it's almost got anger problems, but no one's asking what's really going on with this kid. Mm. So that depression continues up until, I mean, boy, you know, even now sometimes I get little waves of it, but I'm able to control it. Mm. It starts from a young age and it goes up to this mild depression where I start to self-destruct. Mm. And I start literally saying, now I'm smoking cigarettes. Mm. Something that I never wanted to do, I started doing. Job center, signing on whilst I'm looking at the same people that I sold drugs to. And realizing that I once had money and now I don't. So it's like I've tasted a life yeah, 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 and it's yeah, been yeah. taken away from me. Mm -hmm. And so that self-destruction of, I don't even want to be here. What am I doing? Mm -hmm. Then you're starting to lose the social status. Mm -hmm. Everything that you built up is now crumbling. Mm -hmm. Then it goes to suicide. Mm -hmm. When you get to suicide, you're done. Mm -hmm. You get me? It's like, so four suicide attempts and I, on my last suicide attempt, um, my cousin came to me 
and she basically told me that she's been going to this church mm -hmm. and she thinks that it'll be good for me. Now, guess who the same cousin is? The same one that lost her arms and legs. Wow. And she was the only one that could speak to me. Mm. So she said, come. I said, say no more. You're the one telling me, I'll go. Went there, everything changed. Just done. I heard this message of life. I was in an environment that was positive. I was never in positive environments. Mm. I think the only positive environment I could say was my family, but even there, because it's my family, I have an attachment, I'm expecting them to ask me how you're doing, so yeah, I can't even yeah, truly yeah, be yeah, happy yeah, around yeah, them. Yeah, yeah. But now I'm in an environment where I'm watching people jump and praise mm. God, and there's something about the atmosphere that's different. I'm like, I want this feeling. And you don't have the, expect um, the expectancy as well that you would have with your family, where yeah. it's like, I expect you to ask yeah, me yeah, how yeah. I'm doing, where you going to church, it's like, I, I don't really know what to... Yeah. So... That environment, that atmosphere that's positive lifted my spirit. I didn't hear the gospel, mm. but I just knew I wanted whatever these people had. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So I gave my life to Jesus like some donut. <laughs> some donut. <laughs> no, I say that. And this is why I say that. <laughs> this is why I say that. I gave my life to Jesus and I didn't know what I was giving my life to. Yeah. Yeah. No one preached the gospel. So I, I, I could have given my life on the message about tithing. Mm. Like, do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, no one yeah, told yeah. me that Jesus died for my sins or anything. I just got up and walked to the front and I'm giving my life to Jesus. Yeah. And then I left as an atheist and I was so confused. I told my ex, I just gave my life to Christ. She's like, wait, what? Because she was a Catholic. Okay. But I talked her out of it. You know, so she's like, what do you mean? Like, the next week now, I weren't planning on going to church. I was just going to chill in bed. Mm. She said, stay in bed. This means, and then my cousin phones me and says, come church. I go to church. That was it. Boom. That one there, that service, mm. I finally heard the gospel. The guy was talking into my soul, telling me that this thing's blocked, it's over, it's this, it's that. Then he does an altar call at the end. So I finally heard the gospel. He does an altar call at the end. And I didn't go down this time, maybe out of pride, but I sat down in my seat and I said, Jesus, if you're real, show me. Mm -hmm. And I left that church and that was different. Mm. Everything changed. Unforgiveness gone. Anger gone. Immediately. And bro, imagine carrying that since 12. I gave my life at 23. I felt different. I knew something changed. That's 11 years. 11 years. I came out of there. I know what it feels like to be dead inside mm. and then get that jolt of life. I know that something's different inside of you. Mm. I felt it and I was like, I need to stay here. Mm. That's what threw me into the scriptures. That's what pushed me to break up with my girl at the point. Mm -hmm. Like so much was happening. Bro, I went home that same evening. My girl's in bed. Yeah, my ex, she's in bed. I'm not even going to tell you about that situation. But <laughs> nothing happened, nothing happened. This came on, nothing happened. But I remember we're in bed watching Surviving Compton. There's this, there's this movie, Surviving Compton. We're watching mm -hmm. it. And then she's trying to, you know, get frisky with mm -hmm. me. And I said, no. And listen to me. As God is God, I'm looking at you guys, yeah? As God is God, thunder and lightning went off as soon as I said no. You mean outside just? Outside the house. As soon as I said no to her, I don't want to. Boof, boof. The room lit up. She looked at me and went, that's weird. I went, yeah. Bro, I was an atheist. I, I could literally tell you that. Yeah, I started to believe in Jesus, but two hours before that when I was in the service, yeah, yeah, yeah. Nah. that was like a confirmation to me. Next day, people were saying, oh, well, you're different, you're this, you're that. I'm like, well, whatever this thing is, I need to keep it. Mm. That's what made me, you know what I mean, just stay with God and all the rest of it. So, yeah, man. If no one else really understands this, God has to be real. Yeah. Just from what you're saying. Yeah. No one can tell me God ain't real. <laughs> like no one, he has to be. No one can tell me. No one can tell me. You, you go to, you get saved at, uh, you give your life to Christ at 23. And you talk about in your story, there's like four churches in four years. I think. Yeah. Did you experience any kind of church hurt to why you transition from four churches to four years? Because that, isn't something heard of people going to four different churches in yeah. four different years? I wouldn't say church hurt. Okay, what would you say then? Disagreement. Mm. All right, I'm going to say this. <sighs> Take a deep breath on that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I could ever label something as church hurt. I'd label it as people hurt. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah so okay. I'd, I'd change the words. And I wouldn't even say they hurt me. I wouldn't even say they hurt me. So I went to one church and obviously, like I said, um, I got saved, felt this jolt of life. So I was just reading the Bible. I was in the gospels through and through, just mm -hmm. flicking, 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 flicking. 
within about two months, I started to notice that what they were teaching wasn't what I was seeing. Got you. So that's what caused me to come from that church. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I then went to another church which was more youthful. Mm -hmm. um, I started to get influence inside that place, mm. um, but I started to see contradictory behavior. Mm -hmm. So it was preaching one thing, but practicing another. So it was preaching, but sexual immorality. It was yeah, preaching, yeah, yeah, but yeah. cussing and swearing mm -hmm. and all the rest of it. So I saw something inside there that caused me to come out. Yeah, yeah. Um, the next one that I went to had everything that I wanted, discipleship, mm -hmm. mentoring. Um, growth to mm -hmm. everything that you'd want inside a church people from different ethnicities all worshiping the same in the same church yeah, yeah, yeah. but eventually in that church the people told me that i wasn't saved because i wasn't baptized by them so they said because i didn't go down in the water by their hands mm -hmm. i was a pharisee i wasn't saved etc now for me i've experienced grace i didn't start under the law no one taught me Moses. Mm -hmm. I started with a God who loved me in my sin. Yes, That's yes. my reference point for mm -hmm. my salvation. Yeah, yeah. So my experience of God counteracts every law-based religious thing that you could bring to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I have this contradiction and conflict with these people of, I didn't save myself. Mm -hmm. Whilst I was in sin, he saved me. Mm -hmm. So I love God because of that. So I've started with grace. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The whole, everything about it is just grace. It's just, I, I get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But when you start telling me that I didn't go down in water mm. and that I'm not saved because I didn't go down in water by you guys, mm. to me, even though I didn't have biblical backing to defend myself then, it's not lining up. it wasn't lining up. So I remember, because I loved the way this church was, I remember saying that just like Paul was going to um, shave his hair or something, I can't remember which one it was, it was either shaving his hair or getting circumcised for the sake mm -hmm. of the Jews. Mm -hmm. I said, I'll go down in water again just for their sake so they can get off my back. Mm. And I went to go meet them and they, it was the weirdest situation. I'm in a room of 30 guys all sat around, they're doing a Bible study mm. and they're trying to convince me to get baptized by them. And I've gone there in my mind, questioning my salvation if I'm saved. Wow. Wow. So imagine, I've, bro, the night when they told me I weren't saved, I've gone home, I've told my friend on the phone, bro, I haven't been saved this whole time. Bro, it, was, it, it felt so wrong in my head. It felt like there was, like my head was going for a spiral. I couldn't, it was like a mad spiritual attack. I went to sleep. My friends phoned my other friends saying, bro, get in contact with Omar. I don't know what's going on. With He's saying that all of us aren't saved. Da -da -da -da. Bro, I wake up the next day. I'm like, I'm a madman. What was all that about last night? I'm, and then I'm on the phone with my boy and I'm saying, listen, I'm going to go there and I'm going to get baptised just like, you know what I mean, for the sake of them. Mm. I remember pulling up, sitting down in a room of 30 of them. They're telling me the gospel like I don't know the gospel. So mm. they're telling me that they're really getting under my skin at this point, right? Mm. And then they say, so what do you say? I looked at all 30 of them. I said, I'm not getting baptised by you guys. I've got this guy to my, to my right saying, hey, drop your pride, drop your pride. I'm saying, what do you mean drop my pride? Then I've got the next one saying, you're the biggest Pharisee I've ever met. Then I'm like, wait, 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 hold on. How come the thing switch up so? Bro, you see what I'm saying? You get yeah, me? Yeah, yeah, So yeah, then yeah. I look across at one guy and I go, bro, you've seen my Instagram. He goes, yeah. He goes, do you think I've done that to myself? I goes, do you think I love uploading that way? Mm. I said, I didn't do that to myself. God did it. Mm -hmm. So you telling me right now that I'm not saved makes no sense. One of them stands up. I'm done with you. Done with this. Walks out. Bro, all 30 of them. And I start looking at all of them saying, this is your church, you know. Me. Yeah. Bro, I think I was about 25, 26. Nah, 25. Young man in a room full of 30 big men. I'm sat down there trying to convince me to get baptised by them. They're saying that they're the only church that is saved. Only 6,000 of them. All the other Christians aren't saved. Bro, it was the weirdest experience. Anyway, that situation's happened. <laughs> now, think about it. Me being on the roads, mm -hmm. getting rushed by multiple people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was getting rushed by 30 men with scripture. And I'm there holding myself. Jeez. I got up, walked out, left, went, and then I ended up at Ark. So I experienced a whole load of different churches in four years to land at my home where I've been ordained as an elder and I've got a church that's growing right now. But I think I had to go through all of that. That was necessary. You know what's mad about your story, Omar? You know what's mad? The first two churches, things didn't line up. The third church, things didn't line up. To, to what you were reading and to things didn't feel right. So things didn't line up, that's why you left. In that third church, there's 30 guys, as you just explained, you were used to being in situations from 11 till 
mm-hmm. of people, guys, crowding around you, trying to get you to react, trying to get you to a position to be like, your anger should then take over, your pride should take over. In that moment, there was a clear transformation that had already happened mm. for you to react how you did. But it just feels like... <laughs> Like, your life, inside and outside of church, Uh is just one, is just only you could live this life and still be here. (laughs) Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Only you could live this life and still be here. I I guess so. I guess so. I guess so, bro. I don't, I don't, yeah, I guess because obviously it doesn't stop there, innit? Like, bro, church, bro, people are people. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know what I mean? Course. Like, I've encountered, I've encountered people. Yeah, like, yeah. So, even in the best church, you're going to encounter people that are getting things misconstrued, gossiping, saying 100%. this, saying that. And then it's like, should I even voice how I feel about this? Then in my head, I have that, wait. And this is where things have probably affected me. But mm-hmm. I think it's affected me for the, for the, for the good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm saying it's not, pompous arrogant or anything of the sort but i didn't grow up in church so when there's bickering Mm -hmm. or gossip to me it's like that's so childish like who does that i've been on the roads we direct i'm direct come talk to me you know what i mean like so when i'm just like oh bless you like do you know what i'm saying (laughs) so i don't do that do you know what i mean and Mm. so it's affected me in many ways in the way that i deal with things now so i and this is why i say i have no regrets Mm -hmm. because i could be someone who can get ticked off by the smallest of things Mm -hmm. but really truly things bounce off me if that's a good thing Mm -hmm. it's a good thing if it's not then it's not so i think to add to it i've been through counseling Mm. and it was oh my whoa it was it was transformational for me because I don't think I had a good cry until I started counselling. Mm. I think I broke down for like three to four days. Wow. I couldn't stop crying. I couldn't tell you why I was crying. Mm. She asked me a triggering question and it just caused me to think. And bro, I was just stuck inside this, this dead place as a believer mm. of, does, do people like me? Mm. Does anyone see me? So I remember it clearly. I was in Ark. One of the brothers went up to give a testimony and he said, I left the church because I didn't get the stage quick enough. And I heard the test. The testimony was beautiful. But one, when he said that, something stuck with me. And I said, why do you want the stage? Mm. And then in my, I went into my head and I was like, wait, do people like me for me or do they like me for the stage? Mm. And I was just stuck in this, this thing of, wait, do I even have friends? Wait. Now you're, na- now you're back at where you was when you were 11. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and I'm questioning everyone around me because I'm like, is this all real? Is this, is this fake? Do people really love me? Mm. Or do they love my gift? Which one is it? Because mm. I, no one really asked me about my life. Do you know what I mean? Like, so I'm like, wait, I've been feeling alone this whole time. Mm. Four days, four to three days, just broken, crying. Mm. Gone to mum, talking with mum. Because there was a situation where... I don't even know how to rig it up. No, 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 no. no, 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 no. (laughs) (laughs) But I'm bringing up situations that happened in the past where someone should have spoken to me. Someone should have recognised that Omer's in gangs or there's guns around or there's weed around. So let me speak with with him and see what's going on. Uncle's not checking in. Dad not checking in. Mum not really asking questions. Just five children. I get it. Do you know Mm. what I mean? So there's this serious neglect that I've had. It's just a theme throughout my life, neglect. Mm. So I love everything, it's been self-nurturing. Mm. I've been self-nurturing, making mistakes, figuring it out, becoming, becoming, becoming. And then I get to this place where I break down for four days, crying, bawling my eyes out. And then on the opposite side of that cry, I become someone different. I needed to break down. I needed that cry mm. to heal that release and it brought it healed me now i can tell you that i'm an emotional person mm. i wasn't mm. I, I think a lot i'm in my head a lot now mm. i can rationalize and i can be emotional at the same time and it's it's beautiful mm. so all, all of it's been necessary i want to move to talking about you and rona 
and how how does the impact of who she is and you two getting married have on the person you are? All right, so I think I'm wifey. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> what does the impact of Rona have on my life? Um, so one of the things I did say was that I'd been in, I'd been involved with a lot of women in the past, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I never really knew what it was to love a woman. Mm. Um, even my relationship with my ex before Christ, I thought I loved her. It was toxic. It mm. wasn't real love. Mm -hmm. um, so when I got saved, I had made a commitment to say I'm never getting in a relationship mm. because I'd done so much hurt to girls, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then um, God does one thing. He allows me to be able to, you know what I mean, say, no, like, this is a desire of yours, you know what I mean, get into a relationship, and mm. then me and Rona meet. Um, in me and Rona, I met someone who was elegant. Mm -hmm. I met someone who carried herself like a woman. Mm. Someone who, I guess in the past, I wasn't used to a woman that carried herself like Rona. Mm -hmm. um, I was used to someone completely different, yeah, yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? But I'm meeting this woman and obviously she preaches, if you've seen her preach, it's just fire, right? Mm -hmm. So I meet her and I'm intrigued by this passion that she has to preach and mm. I haven't seen another girl like her. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, tell me about yourself like yeah, I want to yeah. know more and because the conversation was so natural and it was just fluid I was like yeah I actually like you yeah, 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 yeah. without even realizing it I liked her mm -hmm. and anyway one day we we talk and I basically say yeah I like you da, 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 da. so we, one thing falls into another thing we get into a relationship right mm -hmm. in that relationship she has changed me in more ways than I think she even knows. Mm. I don't think she recognizes it. I am so intentional about her, mm. about my wife, that, I don't know, it's like, put the church to the side for a second. Mm -hmm. Put the church to the side. My life is her, mm. you know what I mean? And, I think back in the days, I would have never said that about a woman. Mm. I would have never said that, yeah, I'm devoting my life to make sure that my wife is good. I would have never said that. I would have said, oh, that's a joke, man. That's a waste, man. What are you doing? Do you know what I mean? But now, it's really, she's, and I think it's just the way that she carries herself. She's not argumentative. Mm. And if there is an argument, she doesn't raise her voice. Mm. I, I am a... <laughs> <laughs> Rona is very much a, you don't know. All right. All right, talk to me when you're calmed down. And so I'll boil up and then have to simmer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's got to come down now. To talk to her. Mm -hmm. So I'll feel like the fool. Yeah, yeah, because you're, you're already here. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's like, I'm not used to that. I'm used to someone pouncing back. And nah, she's not that way. So I've, she's really helped me with my conflict management. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So everything about us right now is our communication. That's our whole relationship. It's communication, consideration. We communicate everything. Mm. This is where I'm at right now in my head. I don't think that I can do this right now. Um, I'm struggling with this aspect of our relationship, etc. Mm. So a lot of what I know from the, back in the days was I couldn't be vulnerable with a girl unless she, she you know what I mean? She takes advantage. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I have no problems with Rona. Mm. Back in the days, if I was the one to be the one who would open up about emotions, I'd feel like the girl, toxic masculinity is what the girls want to label yeah, 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 yeah. So I wouldn't open up about emotions unless she says, hey, you move like a girl. It, like, nah, bro, like, I really open up to her and say, this is how I am. And I feel like she's the only person that really does get me mm. out of everyone. So she's changed me in more ways than one. And to add to that, I am leading a church. I don't think most girls can get with a guy who can do that. Let's talk about leading the church. Let's talk about Art Point 2.0. Let's talk about you doing this before you turn 30. <coughs> Let's talk about you get married and get the church in the same 12 months. No. How do you do that? And how do you manage the heavy mantle that is on your shoulders? Like I said, um, everything that's happened in my life hasn't been me doing yeah, yeah, it, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah? So even when I proposed to her, I didn't necessarily have a plan mm. of 
what I was going to do. So lockdown came and I was like, you know what, let me get the ring. And I just got the ring. Obviously, I'm studying theology at the time as well. Theology is really helping me out with just um, my understanding of God and mm -hmm. grace and stuff. Now, this pastor thing, before I go into everything, was never something that I wanted to do. Mm. Never. Never. Like... And until this day, I have a love-hate call with my... I have a, a love-hate relationship with this call. Mm. I study theology. I'm starting to see why theology is necessary for me as a Christian. Mm. Um, I've, I'm looking at Rona. I'm reconciling that this woman's fantastic. She's got a ministry that could be global. Mm. And I'm like, this relationship isn't without purpose. It has a purpose. Mm -hmm. So I propose and then we start talking about marriage, but I'm starting a church and this is the issues that we kind of ran into was me managing a huge church while she manages a big wedding. Mm. And so what we were experiencing in the run up to our wedding was me focused on one thing and her focused on one thing, two big things. Mm -hmm. And so we were missing each other in communication. Wow. Because I was feeling the weight of the church while she was feeling the weight of the planet. Mm. And so she'll ask me for help, but my capacity was limited. And I needed help with the church, but her capacity was limited. Mm -hmm. So we're entering into this covenant with each other with like these heavy weights on our shoulders mm. that we've communicated and we're missing each other. It's just like little tiny arguments, but we're never really arguing. It's mm. just you can feel that there's something in the air. So... There was a lot of friction. Me and her have no qualms. But what I'm saying is that there was a lot of friction in starting this church. So what people see mm. isn't what's, what's, what's... It, there's a lot of behind the scenes yeah, stuff yeah, yeah, that's yeah, going yeah. on with what you're doing in the church. Not to mention I'm in university. So I have seven assignments in the space of two weeks that I need to hand in whilst preparing sermons. And if you know anything about sermon preparation, that's a lot. Mm. And if you're preaching back to back to back... You hardly have any space for your own emotions at yeah, times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm learning that I can't function the way that I'm functioning because mm. I'm burning out. I'm not even reading my Bible for devotion. No more. I'm reading to teach people. Yeah. So I'm starting to lose this, this joy mm. of preaching. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And at times I still lose it mm. because it's, 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 it's one thing to just teach in a school. Yeah. It's another thing to preach and have to deal with people's mindsets and get them to see things differently and have to work people and observe what's in the congregation and then apply something that you can kind of pick up in the room and have mm. to navigate people. Bro, you're looking at facial expressions, yeah, lifting yeah, yeah, the atmosphere, yeah. doing this, doing that. So yeah. doing that back to back, week by week mm. and feeling like no one gets it yeah. is crazy. Mm. Not to mention whilst pastoring, you've got people's perspectives. So people will come into the church and if they've had previous issues with their last pastor they automatically project it onto Aren't you, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. or if someone has an issue with god because you seem like the mediator yeah they have an issue true. with you mm -hmm. so you have to deal with people's misconceptions and people assuming your personality mm. and never really knowing you mm -hmm. so imagine going through all of that having to reconcile when there should be no reconciliation it's just your issue mm -hmm. and then coming having to speak with your your girl who you're about to get married to and she can't really provide you the support that you need not to mention she needs support from me while she's doing the wedding stuff. Yeah, 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 so yeah, you've yeah. got this heaviness wow. of not being understood anywhere. Mm. Then you've got a leadership team who, ain't, who isn't understanding. And then you have to sit down with your leadership team and talk about this and talk about that. And so I realised very quickly that I have to learn how to manage my own burnout and look after myself. Mm. Me and her got married. And the marriage started amazingly. It's still going amazingly. I think that we've made it. I've had to make the intentional effort of making sure that home is my first ministry. Mm -hmm. um, but how do I handle the mantle of it? I think ultimately, and I think this comes down to my faith, mm. um, per my personal faith, is because I was saved in such a way, um, because I haven't necessarily had to do anything, and because I look at everything that I've been through in retrospect, mm -hmm. and I journal a lot, because I can look back, I can see how God's hand has been in my life. Mm. Because of that, I don't stress. Mm. Because I know that he's the one doing this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I say, I didn't save myself. Mm -hmm. Because I didn't save myself, it's his will, it's his bill. Mm -hmm. I'm not paying for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You yeah, know what good. I mean? That's good. So, and I think, just to land this point, is we're, we're going to be a year 
in ministry. And I recognize that everything that I didn't receive as a believer mm. is what I'm giving. Mm. So I didn't necessarily get the strong discipleship. No one really nurtured me or stood beside me and said, don't go this way, go that way. Mm -hmm. Because of that, everything that I have, I now give to everyone else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what I'm seeing in giving mm -hmm. is that I'm receiving. Mm. And so that's blessing me. Mm. It's blessing the ministry. Um, I guess the ministry is becoming bigger and bigger and bigger. And I love that. What it also does, though, is it brings more people to look after. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so it means more structures, more behind the scenes. And I guess, yeah, all that stuff's worked out through my previous journey. Mm. What's the vision for Art 2.0, but more importantly, what's the vision for yourself and for your home? Okay. The vision for myself and my home mm. is, <sighs> I wanted to retire in Ghana. Mm. I wanted to, I don't know if I can anymore. Okay. Um, that was my, my ambition before Christ, now I realise that I've been called to London, the UK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know if God's calling me outside of that, but mm. my whole ambition was to retire in Ghana and live in Ghana abroad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was my ambition for my family. At this point, my ambition for my family is to see us well off, mm. not to see us struggling for anything, yeah, not to yeah. see ministry causing division in my house. Yeah. Like I say, my wife is my first ministry. Happy mm. wife, happy life. That's it. If I don't look after her, then I, how am I going to look after other people? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if she isn't looking after me, how can I look after other people? Yep. So everything about me right now, even when it comes down to children, is my wife is still my first ministry. Mm. And she'll always be my first ministry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because of that, I don't think we'll lack for anything, we'll want for anything. Um, we're setting down plans now for what we're establishing in the next five years. Mm -hmm. So we want to see things elevate and kick off um, for the both of us. Um, my ambition for her is that she wouldn't be stuck in teaching forever. Mm. I want to get her out of that. <laughs> I want this girl to, I want her to fly yeah, with yeah, her, yeah. like, because she's got a gift that I don't think a lot of people recognize. Mm. In my opinion, my wife is the greatest female preacher touch on this planet. Oh, wow. In my, in my opinion, hands down. And I'd love to see her just take that and just allow God to speak through her and impact a generation of women that need it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? So I want to really free her from her work. Mm -hmm. and allow her to do ministry and what God's called her to be. Yeah. Um, I don't know, people call us a dynamic duo. Mm. I'd, I'd love to see if we could do something Tacky about too, that. Tacky you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to see if we could do something about that in the future as well. Um, with regards to family, obviously children. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely. Um, we've been speaking about it for a while. Mm. Um, so yeah, children, maybe in the next year or two, I just need to make sure this church is standing before I bring another little baby into the mix. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, children on, on the cards. Um, with the church, so we're looking at, I've got a division for 25 years in the future. Oh, nice. We're currently looking into getting a building, mm -hmm. a big building, mm -hmm. um, where we can obviously grow a building that can hold 600 people. Right now we're at 200 members. Um, I don't think the vision for 2.0 is to be a mega church. Mm. I don't think the vision is to be a mega church at all. Um, in in we're invested in discipleship and we don't want to lose people in the crowd. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know yeah. what I'm saying? So I don't think 2.0 is a mega church, but definitely planting more congregations is, mm. is something that I'm interested in. Um, obviously, we don't want to see Christianity just die out in this generation. Mm -hmm. And we don't want it to be a thing where people look at this generation and think this generation haven't got anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So my whole ambition for 2.0 is to bring the name of Jesus back up. Mm. I'm not so interested in the apostolic, the prophetic, the, I'm not interested in titles mm. and gifts. I'm interested in Jesus. Yeah. Like, and so I really just want to bring fame back to his name yeah, in the yeah, UK. Yeah. And I hope that Ark 2.0 can do that. My mm -hmm. prayer is that Ark 2.0 would do that. Yeah, so yeah. that's that's it really and truly in a nutshell, just authentic, transparent truth of mm. who Jesus Christ is and a, and, a, and a wish that people would come out of legalism and fall under grace mm. and fall in love with Jesus all over again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is the ambition. My last question to you. With where you're at in life right now, what encouragement or advice would you give to yourself? To myself? Yeah, yeah, yeah. As in Oma today? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jesus. That's a good question. Slow down. Mm. 
slow down. I think I tell myself to slow down. Um, yeah, I'd say slow down. I'd say take your time, um, breathe. Don't think that you have to do everything so quickly mm. in order to just be okay. Because breathe, like live in the present, don't live in the future. There, there is, there's something great about being future focused, but there's an anxiety that comes with it as well. Mm. So try and take each day as it comes and realize that you've got years on you. You're 29, you've probably got another 30 to 40 years in this thing. So don't think you have to do everything at once. I think that'll be my encouragement, slow down, mm. be patient. Mr. Omar Taki. It's been a pleasure. I appreciate you, sir. It's you been know. a pleasure, sir. Thank I you. I appreciate you. This Thank you for having me, man. Amazing conversation. Um, and to you guys watching at home, make sure you go check out everything Art 2.0, everything Omar Taki, everything Rona Taki, everything, Please. everything. This man and this woman, they're both amazing people of God. And they're going to make a massive change. I definitely believe that. So, yeah, this has been Conversation with H. With Mr. Omar Taki, we've got a lot more.